Can you guys hear me okay? That's not enough. Can you guys hear me okay? So I've attended Lesbians Who Tag for the last three years. And so before we get started with the Ignite Talks, I'm actually going to do something different. I hope Leanne doesn't kill me. So let me have everyone get up. Just get up. Stand up. <laughs> awesome. So what I realized is that right after lunch, we all get the itis. We're going to shake the itis off. But <laughs> we're going to do a popular dance. And if you know this dance called Dab, give me a round of applause. <laughs> if not, we're going to run through a quick tutorial. So here's how it goes. Pay attention. I'm only going to do it once. You're going to pretend you're sneezing into your hands. And it goes like this. Can everybody try that? Awesome. So let's do one quick tutorial practice, and then we're going to go after this. Ready? I'm going to say, pipe it up. And when I say dab, you guys dab, OK? You ready? Pipe it up. Dab. Woo, that was good. <laughs> that was good. We're going to do it twice. Pipe it up, dab. Pipe it up, dab. OK. Five times, and then we call it a day. <laughs> Are you guys ready? Shake it off. Pipe it up, dab. Pipe it up, dab. Switch it up, dab. Pipe it up, dab. Switch it up, dab. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> All right, so really excited to bring the Ignite Talks to you. And for those of you who are not familiar with Ignite Talks, it's really an explosive five-minute presentation by some really amazing speakers. OK, so without further ado, we're going to go ahead and bring up the first uh, speaker. Let me tell you a little bit about Perry. Perry's born in the UK, raised in Germany. She brings passion and unique perspective to training adult coders. She's really proud that her organization has a strong commitment and inclusivity and diversity. Please welcome Perry to the stage. Hi, everybody. I hope you had a really good lunch. All right, yes, indeed. My name is indeed Perry Ising, and um, I'm a developer and also an educator. I'm down from Portland, Oregon. And right, that right there in the middle is my mom. She grew up in a pretty crummy working class suburb called Watford, um, and there she is in 1969 in a pretty ugly dress. Um, my mom was really smart, really ambitious, but she didn't receive much education, and she didn't receive very much encouragement. So 1969 also happened to be the year of the first man on the moon and also happened to be the year of the first ARPANET direct forum to today's LWT, I suppose. And 1969 was also the year that my mom was looking for her first real job. So if you, want, if you will, imagine the scenario. She's sitting at the kitchen table with her best friend. She's looking through the newspaper. She doesn't want to be a nurse. She doesn't want to be a secretary. What she wants is a career. So she comes across an ad that reads, computer operators wanted, no experience necessary. So how many of you have actually seen one of these? Awesome, really great. Um, so the ad reads, computer operators wanted, no experience necessary. So my mom turns to her friend and she says, what exactly is a computer? <laughs> and her friend sort of looks at the ad and turns back to her and says, well, it doesn't really matter, does it? It says you don't need experience. And so that's how in 1969, my mom became a computer operator for the Sellotape company. She took her first step and became a computer operator. Sellotape is basically like scotch tape in Britain. So she was really smart, and she was really ambush ambitious, and she pushed herself really hard. So she ended up becoming a senior operator, then a programmer, then a lead. And she worked for really amazing, huge companies, such as Parker Pen, American Express, IBM. By the way, how awesome was Edie Winter? So she was, so she told me these stories of working on these giant, giant computers, like filled entire rooms, these massive mainframes. And sometimes she would be like sitting at the kitchen table, debugging code by hand on these like massive stacks of printer paper and, uh, until late into the night with a pen. And then I'd hear a shout when she found like the missing bug. And so she pushed herself in other in, and took on other challenges as well, like when she was recruited to her all-male running team. And she ended up completing half marathons just like a bare year or so after she started. And she inspired me to get into tech, and she also inspired me to run and to race. So when my mom got sick with breast cancer many, many years later, doing the Race for the Cure really helped me feel connected to her. And even though our relationship was really quite complicated a lot of the time, 
We were connected by running, and we were also connected by our passion for working in tech. We had a lot of conversations frequently about how difficult it could be to survive and to succeed in male-dominated environments with very, very obvious gender bias like this one. But she taught me that you have to say yes to all kinds of challenges in, able, in order to succeed. She said yes to this, for example. And as I sort of moved forward through my life, I learned how to say yes to challenges myself, like when I decided to move to the United States through a community that I met online through websites such as Technodike. I don't know if anybody remembers Technodike. And also I thought of that moment when I decided to join LWT and I came down to the summit last year totally on a whim. So I also got help through my LWT chapter up in Portland to attend a code school, which I then also said yes to that challenge as well. So I ended up being accepted and enrolling in an advanced Java and Android class, which through Epicodus was the first all-female women trans and genderqueer identified class. So those are my classmates right there. They're really, really awesome, awesome people. You should definitely hire them. And then after completing that class, I was offered a job teaching. So these are now my students that I work with and I teach every day. And I think about that moment with my mom, because like my mom, they have no experience, none. And they're learning brand new skills every day. And so I'm, they're kind of like, they're kind of like those two, and I'm kind of like that. <laughs> That's kind of like me. And I, I know that we need more women, trans, genderqueer, POC, differently able people involved in tech, and I really love getting connected to the people who are helping make that happen. Because for me, it's really just about that moment in the kitchen, you know, when someone turns to you and says, you know what, you can do that job. And it's about taking risks. My mom would be really, really proud of the work that I'm doing and things like this presentation. Obviously, unfortunately, she passed away two years ago, but her bravery really continues to inspire me. And so I guess what I'm asking you to do, all of you together, is in a way to continue her work. And that is, quite simply, to not let the things you don't know define you. And remember that moment and say yes. Thank you. Good job. Really, I think we're all inspired by your work, Perry. All right. Um, so up next, we've got February Keeney. She's an engineering manager at GitHub. A bit about February. She's passionate about building inclusive workplaces and online communities. Presently, she's uh, furthering these goals in her role as an engineering manager for the community and safety team at GitHub. February can be frequently seen taking photos of the sidewalk and power lines. Left unattended at conferences, she'll seek out a piano and start covering B pop B-sides. <laughs> I haven't found one here yet. <laughs> I'm February, just like the month, except I'm taller. Um, anyway, about in late 2014, I needed a new job. So I went out, got myself some interviews, and was all ready to receive some fabulous offers, but that's not what happened. Instead, I was getting declined. A lot. Now, I spent a I've been doing this for 19 years. I've spent a lot of time, many hours on both sides of the interview table. I know a good interview, I know a bad interview. Not all of these interviews I had were good. But the ones that were would go multiple rounds, there's multiple callbacks, sometimes in excess of 10 hours. And then they'd turn me down for something really trivial that we talked about in the initial phone screen as being a non-issue for the position. And this struck me as really odd. And I know it's kind of tacky to complain because if you're a woman in tech, this is basically just what the story is when you're looking for a job. The strange thing for me was that for the first 15 years of my career, every time I had an on-site interview, I got a job offer. Every single time. But those first 15 years of my career, I presented mail. <laughs> yeah, I know. So the same exact candidate, I interviewed just like I did before, which is darn well, and yet completely different outcomes. My career had become an A-B test in gender. So recently I had an opportunity to interview 34 different women on the same day. And what I did was I asked all the same questions and I took really good notes and I used the same criteria to rate them. And I noticed that my, the rating that I had in my head versus what I had on paper were deviating in many cases. And sometimes people that I thought had done really well, their score wasn't all that great. And some people that I thought had done 
poorly, their scores actually were pretty good. And I started thinking about why, why is this? Why am I thinking some of these people are better than they are and some are not quite as strong as they are? What's going on here? And I realized that it was those who I would have found that I could make easy friendships with, I was rating higher. And those who I knew that like a friendship would be something that we would have had to work at and it'd be a little bit harder were those I was rating lower. But the thing when we're hiring is we're not trying to hire friends. We're trying to hire people that can do a job. So this is why it's super important that in our hiring processes at every company, we are actually using criteria that are objective and we're evaluating the candidates against what the job requires and not against how much fun they'd be to go out for beers with that night. Now, another important factor in all of this is that you have to take good notes to do this. You have to take good notes, look at your own notes, you'll see biases that you didn't expect to be there. Further, if your entire hiring team shares notes, you're able to call each other out on that stuff. And you're also able to call out people that are pulling in bullshit like culture fit, which is a polite way of saying not like me. And really at beg questions about what the job requires. So, I'm a trans woman. When I speak for a long time, it's not uncommon for me to drop voice. And when that happens, especially when I'm talking tech, you know, it's going to mean that if you haven't read me as trans yet, you're going to in that moment. And during these interview processes over the course of that, that year it took me to get a job, there were several times when I'd be staring across the table at this guy and I'd see that moment where he realized I was trans. And then that moment where he realized that he was attracted to me. And then that moment where the homophobia just climbs, shines through his eyes, and he goes, am I gay? <laughs> no. No, you're not. It means you're straight. And even if, you, even if it didn't mean you were gay, what's wrong with being gay? Asshole. <laughs> so the thing about this is, is that all these assholes have to do to keep me from getting a job is say, she's not a good fit. They can even otherwise give me a very positive and glowing review. We have to call out this type, these types of, of non-qualifier statements, these vector biases, when we find them in the hiring process. We have to question them and seek to actually get at why people are saying that and seek to show others that these are not actually valid criteria. These things, taking good notes, using common questions, common criteria, eliminating vector biases, these are the basics of a fair hiring process. And if a company is not doing these, they should be called out for it. Um, in the case, one of these rejections, one of these rejections that I had, two women spoke up. And now here I am, community and safety manager at GitHub, all because two people spoke out. So speak out. It's the only way we make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get another round of applause for that. Thank you. Awesome. Up next, we've got Lisa. Lisa is a founder of women, uh, Wonder Women Tech. OK, Wonder Women Tech. Uh, so it's a conference and an online platform that highlights, celebrates, and educates women in tech, STEAM, and innovation. She's also founder of Hacks for Humanity a hackathon for social good, and wonder women hacks. As a visionary, Lisa is passionate about changing the world and building a new ecosystem in media and technology. Please give it up for Lisa. Hello. Can you hear me? It's actually Lisa May. I'm going to talk about creating a legacy through social innovation and share my story about how uh, that can actually happen. I believe that when we have a talent and a gift, it's our duty to be able to use that for social good and make an impact in the world. A little bit about me, I'm a social innovator, founder, blah, 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 but I like to skip in public, that's actually true. Michelle Obama once commented on my great dancing at the Ellen Show, so that was really one of my highlights of my career. Um, and I came out at 30 years old and I love hugging, so uh, be, be aware, because I may hug you. I've hugged over 8,000 people, um, and that's a true story. And so um, I believe that hugs and sharing hugs are the way to make friends. 
Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I started a quality TV six years ago. I bootstrapped it for six years, decided that that wasn't going to actually make me any money. Um, but I'm still very passionate about it. I will pick it up later on. But it's, um, I get to do things like build PSAs. I did a national PSA with Nicole Kahn um, and Jen Foster, she for me. Look it up, it's a great music video. So those are some of the things that I've done in the past with Equality TV. Um, but I'm really very excited about moving forward and I decided that I needed to do something bigger. So I launched a global photographic campaign called the I Am Equality Campaign. We launched in 17 cities, five countries, zero budget, but I did have Lady Gaga's photographer do an event in Toronto for me. And this was the end result. We asked people, what will you do to make equality go viral? This was my photo. Um, and that's how I was going to make equality go viral. We had thousands of people participate, and it was really actually a very interesting uh, campaign that I will pick up. Um, I became the founder of my first hackathon. We did uh, an event at ASU where um, we were invited to do a hackathon for social good, so people built mobile apps um, for social good using things like forgiveness, kindness, um, sorry, I have allergies. And then I became the founder of a second hackathon with Wonder Women Hacks, um, where we built mobile apps for women uh, and girls, uh, issues facing women and girls for the California Women's Conference. Um, Sorry. <laughs> um, I believe then that uh, it's very important to invest in a woman. We're natural innovators. So um, I realized then when we had the Commission on the Status of Women approach me to do a, an event for um, the city of LA, I decided to say yes, and Wonder Women Tech was born. So we did a conference that was sponsored by the city of LA, produced by the LA Auto Show um, in the historic Spruce Goose for um, the historic airplane hangar where the Spruce Goose was built. We had over a thousand attendees, very awesome. Um, but after that, uh, I realized that I hit very hard because after you do something big, you always have something that kind of plummets, um, causes you to fail, in other words. Um, the conference didn't go as well as I intended it to do, but life is 10% of what happens to you and 90% of what you know, how you respond to it. So I decided to pick myself back up and do something more amazing. Um, so I decided to work with the US State Department and we did a fish hackathon for mobile apps that contribute to marine life and ocean life. And um, we're doing another one this year during Earth Day weekend. So see me after class and I'll tell you all about it. Um, I get asked to speak at the uh, work with young girls at LMU, a lot of uh, Cal State Long Beach, and a lot of high schools. We get to teach girls how to code and um, build games, so that's awesome. Uh, a lot of what I do, it's always about leaving a legacy, so I always challenge myself to do things that are going to make a difference, and I feel that whatever you're doing, whether you're a scientist or a hugger, you can leave a legacy, and so I ask, what is your legacy? Mine is Wonder Women Tech. So after all of the challenges I faced, uh, the city of Long Beach actually gave me three years uh, to build Wonder Women Tech. So I have a home at the Long Beach Convention Center for the next three years to provide a platform for women in diversity in STEAM. This means that some of you may be on my stage uh, in July. So that's very exciting for me. And we get to be able to highlight, celebrate, and educate women and girls in STEAM. So what's next for me is we're launching a new web series called The Wonder Woman Tech Show, where it's sort of like TechCrunch meets uh, The View. Only all of our hosts are scientists, they're coders, they're developers, and those are actually real girls that are doing those kinds of things on the show. Um, so I challenge you to go forth and positively disrupt the planet with whatever you're doing, whether you're an engineer or a scientist, you can absolutely make a difference. And my story clearly reveals that. Thank you very much. One more round of applause for Lisa May. <laughs> so up next, we've got Tanya, who's an evangelist at Axosoft. So a bit about Tanya. She's an award-winning author, keynote speaker, a creative instigator who has performed his stories at the Edinburgh Festival of French. Tanya's made an audacious leap to, into technology and is currently the curator of code at Axosoft. 
and because every rock star or every company needs a punk. Thank you. Hi. Hi, hi. I prepared a talk today for Lesbians Who Theater, but um, this is Lesbians Who Tech, which I can't believe. So I'll be talking about uh, disbelief. That's a good topic. <laughs> Suspension of disbelief. It's actually the cornerstone of theater. Suspension of disbelief is uh, when we gather in a theater like we're doing right now, and we decide collectively to let go of everything we know to be true about the world around us, all assumptions and perceptions, and together we take a gigantic poetic leap of faith into the unknown. And that's how I landed in tech. I got a phone call from a cool software company called Axosoft, and they're like, Tanya, we've been watching you. We'd like to talk to you about software. And I'm like, a little creepy, but I'll talk to you. <laughs> I knew nothing about software, so I took a leap and had a meeting with the CEO, Laudan Shojai. And she's this uh, like petite, very firecracker direct person, and she's like, we brought you in because we really love your energy. And I'm like, oh, I came in because I really like your energy. And she's like, uh, but we're not offering you a job. And I'm like, I don't need a job. And she's like, but we've always wanted an evangelist. You'd make a great evangelist. And I'm like, an evangelist? That would freak my Jewish mom out. <laughs> yes! I would love to evangelize with you. So I took a leap and landed in my first week of work at a tech company knowing nothing about technology. So I went up to Laudan during the first week and I'm like, okay, so what's this really cool tool that I'm gonna evangelize about? And she's like, oh, it's an agile project management software for software developers, you know, SaaS. B2B, and I had no idea what was coming out of a pie hole. I'd never heard those <laughs> words before. I mean, B2B, I understood who, that's when you convert one of your bedrooms into a charming hotel, <laughs> right? But the rest, and so if this was like the film of my life, the scene two would be like a voiceover that's like, Month two, a lonely lesbian stands at her stand-up desk, looking over hundreds of computers to the horizon, wondering, why the f did I take this job? So month two, Laudan comes to my colleagues here, breeding me, and she's like, we are gonna support the Girls in Tech Conference here in Arizona. I wanna show up in a big way, so come up with a big idea. Nothing like a pushy boss to get you going, huh? So we brainstormed, and we came up with nothing. So I went for a walk. And I'm walking and I'm thinking about girls in tech and women in tech and women in all spaces and how oftentimes we're not seen, heard, or celebrated for the superheroes that we are. And what if we could take principles of theater and weave them in and out of technology, right? I mean, what if we could suspend disbelief and jump into a world where women got paid as much as their male counterparts? And what if we could... And, and, and what if we could fly in, into a world where women made up 50% of C-level positions? And what if we could land in a classroom where a 12-year-old girl takes a coding class because she sees herself in the female teacher, because she sees herself in the girl sitting next to her, because she sees herself and I saw a symbol in my mind's eye on the walk. And I knew that the symbol would be easily recognizable across cultures and genders. And I came back to the office and I'm like, Sarah, I've got a symbol. She's like, awesome. I'm like, no, but I think she's wearing a cape. And I ran and I printed out the women's bathroom symbol. And I took a pen and I made a few strokes and she appeared. It is as if she had been there this whole time, but we just didn't see her. Right before us, she was standing there. And so we launched the It Was Never Addressed campaign. And when you say campaign, <laughs> oh. All your applause have been so delightful, I'm just gonna luxuriate in them as I have 40 seconds left. So here's what I'll tell you. You can, you can, you can watch the rest of this story. I just gave a TEDx, lucky me, um, about it. You can see it online, and I'm gonna let you experience it for the next 30 seconds in silence.
Thanks, Mom. I will give this single call to action. It's important for the arts and technology to merge together because we have to create some unknown worlds together. That's my time. Awesome. Awesome. Wow, that deserves another round of applause. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> wow. So Jennifer, I'm really excited to bring you to the stage. Jennifer is a principal at Forrester, uh, which is a customer experience consultant practice, bringing 25 years of experience in helping comp companies create strong brands and loyal customers. She started her career in strategic customer insights, which formed the foundation for her customer-centric consultant approach. Welcome, Jennifer, to the stage. Thank you. So the future of technology is emotional, not or not only analytical and left brain. We have a lot of cool technologies, robots and self-driving cars and AI and all that stuff is really, really cool. But ultimately the purpose of technology is to power people and therefore human emotions need to power technology. So obviously we have mobile, digital, but even uh, rocket science. You know, if it touches an astronaut, we're dealing with human beings. And, you know, let's not leave out the infrastructure and all of the technology that sits underneath it that normally doesn't necessarily touch a customer, but, but is ultimately powering that entire customer experience. And so often that technology is built completely separate from a real strong understanding of customer needs and desires. But all that's changing because companies really need to grow. And of course, growth, at least organic growth, depends on getting customers loving you, wanting to buy your products, wanting to tell other people about those products. And it also depends on uh, customers, uh, excuse me, companies really want to drive cost savings. But cost savings is driven a lot of times by digital, increasingly, by digital lowering the cost of interactions. How companies, uh, how customers are interacting with your company through e-commerce, adoption of new technologies, and so on. So ultimately, the goal of technology is behavior change. It's dealing with people. And the challenge with behavior change is that it's completely not rational in any way, shape, or form. So we do a lot of research at, at Forrester, and we've identified three factors that drive loyalty. Does it work? Is it really easy to use? And how do customers feel about that experience? And in 11 of 17 industries that we look at, emotion drives loyalty more than any other factor. So you probably know this with any of the products that you use and love every day. And it's not just the products we use every day, even in business to business. So um, Slack, the new uh, hot soft, um, collaboration platform, right? It's taking off, but the founders were just frustrated with the collaboration tools that existed. They were their own customers, so they built it with deep empathy. And when you Google Slack, you actually, the L word comes up a lot in the findings. And L as in love, not lesbians. So. <laughs> <laughs> Some say the future is all about robots and robots are going to take all of our jobs by the year 2025, but if emotion is truly linked to technology, then everybody's jobs should be safe because robots would create a terrible experience, right? But we've all been the victims of terrible experiences that probably could have been developed by robots, which is really terrible. I like to say that I help companies suck less. And so these are really the kind of experiences that I work with my clients on. And these are some verbatims of you know, what we see in some of our research. And our clients feel terrible. They don't intend to deliver a terrible experience. But it's what happens when you don't have the right planning and you don't have the right tools or the thinking about the business from the outside in. So customers have increasing expectations and technology needs to be delivering on those expectations. But when you build a bridge to meet those expectations, you need a plan and you need the right tools to be able to build that bridge. And there's a lot of new tools, which I can talk about later, but uh, customer life cycles and customer journeys and personas, those are all tools that businesses are using through every department of an organization to build the muscle memory around, uh, around empathy. And it's happening in technology organizations as well. We write about customer-obsessed businesses where CIOs are putting customers at the center of their organization and using these tools to align systems and processes and technologies all around a customer goal. 
So at the end of the day, we should be looking at a customer emotion as our ultimate goal, literally across uh, every, every facet of a business. Because the experience that Apple would create is very different than the experience that Dell would create, right? So we all need to be aligned around what kind of perception do we want to create in the minds of customers? How does that link to our ultimate business goals? And backing into what does that mean for us and what we need to do and what we need to measure? We've been told that emotions have no place in business. And of course, that scared off a lot of folks. It's why I think women are playing catch up in a lot of the traditional left brain fields. But ultimately, if emotion is driving business, it's driving growth and cost savings, then emotion is an intrinsic part of doing business. And the people who are highly fluent in emotion should be really good at driving this forward, right? And being and really leading that that uh, that cause. So th what I am calling out for the people in this room is to have the courage to mention the E word, emotion, to all of your left brain colleagues, and to lead that charge because these things, emotion, empathy, are all part of the future. And really, emotion is all about uh, really the future of technology. Thank you very much. Another applause for Jennifer, please. Thank you. <laughs> Last, but certainly not least, excited to introduce Ari Wengroff. She's an LGBT advocate, currently an executive producer for an upcoming Vice Lynch show. She's an associate producer for the award-winning series Vice on HBO, a Wainwright Poetry Award winner, she co-founded the Barn Owl, blogs for the Huffington Post, and her work is published in the United States and Europe. Please welcome Ari Wengroff. Hey everyone. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, Vice is a seen as the leading global youth media company. We started as a little punk rock magazine in Montreal 22 years ago, and now, yeah, there we go. And now uh, we make content in 34 countries all over the world, and we're seen as being successful because, as we put it, we don't bullshit Gen Y. Uh, it has to be content that's made by young people for young people, and the, there's no group that you can bullshit less than women. So we made Broadly, which is by women, for women, about women, and it's content that comes from across the globe where we're giving uh, voices to people who have an, an opportunity to share their personal stories. We're working a lot with video online, and we speak to women's intelligence. We don't undermine it like uh, so many other things out there these days. And one of the things that's been so amazing about it is I think that we have one of the largest global platforms for doing this. Um, we've been incorporating women on all screens, and one of the, what I mean by that is we're platform agnostic. We have stuff on an app, we have stuff online, we have stuff on television, and we incorporate women not only into being on screen, but being behind the camera, to being the coders who make our apps, and and to being all of the people in between in the process. A woman tells her story best if she's also editing it. And what we're going into next is actually we have a television channel that's launching on Monday. We're taking over H2, so if you have that channel, you'll have Viceland. And I'm, uh, I'm cheating a little bit. Leanne's going to kill me. But I'm going to show you a trailer for an upcoming show called Gaycation with Ellen Page. I don't think, yeah, right? <laughs> So uh, Ellen is really amazing. She came to us with this idea. I think it's a really powerful show. As a young person, before I came out, if I saw this, I would have felt extremely empowered by it. So I just want to check it out and show it to you guys. I'm on a journey to explore what it means to be lesbian, gay, bi, or trans all around the world. If you think that you live in a part of the world where there aren't gay people, you're wrong. <laughs> I'm bringing my best friend Ian with me. This is the one. The funny part of this is Ian's more comfortable in a dress than I do. We want to join the celebration. We're at the first Pride event that they're having in Jamaica. Document the struggles. People will hurt you and yeah, yell. Yeah, before I get I get a sick burn. Feel the love and the hate. There's a disorder in you. And I am not going to buy into that it is not a disorder. And bring home every human story we encounter along the way. A lot of people think I'm trans. And I said, no, I'm not transgender. I'm just me, I'm just Steven. Juno X 
actress Ellen Page went head to head with Ted Cruz at the Iowa State Fair Friday. LGBT people can be fired for just being gay or for just being trans. That just doesn't sound very American to me. This is my first time in the gay district of Tokyo, because in the past, I was too closeted to come to the gay area. Here we are in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and despite seeming like a place that is sexually open, the issues that LGBT people face can be really horrific. Being gay is not a choice. The amount of people that struggle so much because of the shame they feel or the fear of being oppressed or hurt or killed. Why would someone make that choice? Why would someone make that choice? It's about people being able to live, not just exist. our vacation. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, there we go. So this show starts uh, next week. Everybody should check it out. But I think what's so important about this show is that it's socially responsible programming. Like what we really believe in is creating quality television that's telling the stories of the people who are around us, right? Like when we look back at history, it's not just the textbooks, it's our culture, and so much of that is conveyed by media. So when we talk about bringing women into the fold or bringing the queer community into the fold, there's a saying there's nothing more powerful than actually giving someone a laptop with internet around the world and we believe that and so we're also bringing young people in into the company and teaching them how to edit young women who didn't think before that maybe that was what they were interested in or designing or coding or anything spike jones who's our creative director in the company and co-president of the network has been helping young people came in and came up with some of the ideas with ellen when she came in initially it's really a collaborative process where everyone can give a suggestion and so i think with that with women it's just always about turning to someone on your left or right and incorporating them in. So thank you.